Okay guys, uh, for this lab, or for this video, what I wanted to do is, is finish up going over the uh, weather patterns lab and, and try to give you enough guidance to be able to finish it. Uh, at this point in the course, you know more than you did when you started this. So what I would suggest is to always go back to the beginning and just make sure that things still look good and still make sense. Uh, especially read over your answers to questions too. Uh, many of your labs, a lot of you are still doing this where like you'll write the beginning of a thought and then it looks like the bell rang and you never finished it and you didn't get the question. Uh, it looked like you wrote an answer, but it says, you know, uh, well, the, the, your answer will end with the word because and, and the meaning isn't there. Uh, so you want to go back and just really make sure you're rereading everything. Anyway, uh, for map A, this was your temperature pattern map. And uh, for this one, remember, here's our station model. We have our air temperature in the upper left. The right side is air pressure, but we're looking at the numbers on the left side. The pattern should be uh, roughly parallel lines. Remember that uh, temperature is to some degree a function of latitude. You know, it's certainly warmer in Texas and Florida than in Maine. So as we go further north in latitude, uh, we should have changes in temperature and we should see uh, a decrease in temperature as we go towards the north, obviously, and it should be roughly uh, parallel isotherm lines. Um, so that's map A. Uh, the questions I think for that are pretty simple. Okay, then we get to uh, map B. Now we have our air pressure map. Okay, we've got our air pressures on the right side and there's a lot more information that would normally go on the station models because this is a lab designed for you know school students uh it's been simplified greatly so here we've got our air pressures and we talked about uh putting a nine or a ten ten in front moving the decimal uh and you want it to end up being close to a thousand millibars so if you're unsure if you should pick the nine or the ten go with whichever will bring you closer to one thousand now on this one, uh, we're not going to have parallel lines, but you should see circles. And I'm, I'm not going to draw the whole thing out for you. Uh, I think you can figure it out. But uh, decode your air pressures and your air pressures. You should see circles and you should see uh, a center of high pressure and a, a center of low pressure. And so you should see two uh, circular patches on the map. And one should be where high pressure is, the other should be marking where low pressure is. And again, I think that the questions there are probably okay. Okay, then we get to surface wind patterns. And remember, you're going to draw a line through uh, showing where the wind is going. Uh, the line on the station model represents where the wind is coming from. But we're going to add in a line to show, or an arrowhead to show where the wind is headed or moving towards. And then it asks you to uh, draw some larger arrows to show the general pattern. And I, I drew this arrow in another video. Uh, I'm not going to draw the arrows for you, but um, you're, you're going to just put larger arrows on the map to show the, the general pattern of wind flow. To be blunt, you're going to draw large arrows showing the direction of the wind around high and low pressure. And that's something that we've talked about in other videos. Uh, as I'm looking at this uh, on the questions for page 247 over here, uh, there's the words convergent and divergent, and they're words you should be familiar with from plate tectonics. If we have convergent air, it means that the air is uh, basically coming together. And on divergent, it's basically moving away. So it says, are the surface winds around high pressure area uh, convergent or divergent? Well, if we have high pressure and the wind is moving outward in a clockwise pattern, that's divergent air. It's moving away from the center of the high pressure, low pressure, uh, would be the opposite. The air is moving in towards the center of low pressure. That would be convergent air. 
Okay, now we get to precipitation patterns. And this is where somebody emailed me with, with some questions and some problems. Uh, and this is where it starts to get a little trickier. And especially when we get into map E, things start getting more complex. So with map D precipitation patterns, uh, on our station model, uh, to make things a little bit simpler, to signify rain, uh, the station model just has a little R in there. So at this station, it's raining. At this station, it's raining. Okay, uh, the others indicate cloud cover, uh, where it's a darkened circle. That's 100% cloud cover. Over here, we would have 50% cloud cover. Okay, and remember, when it's raining, it's certainly going to be more cloudy. But all it's asking you to do here, it says draw a line around the area on this map where there is precipitation. So all you have to do is basically draw a line enclosing all your R's. So you're going to have basically a circular patch on there that, that encloses all of the R's for rain. Mm. Don't have to make more of it than it is. Just enclose the R's. Okay, then it says to lightly shade the area where the precipitation occurs. So then you're going to take your pencil. And I know I have a pen, but I'd really like you to use pencil on this lab. Uh, shade in the area where it's raining. And then this is the part where it's a little tricky. It says on map D, label the location of the continental polar and maritime tropical air masses using appropriate symbols. So we're looking for continental polar and maritime tropical air masses. Remember the symbols are, uh, I'll just write them up here. We've got continental polar, CP, and we have maritime tropical, MT. And your continental polar is going to be cold, dry air. Your maritime tropical is going to be a, uh, sorry, warm ocean air. So all you have to do is put down these symbols where you think you would find that type of air. You know, where on this map would there be cold, dry air? Where on this map would there be warm ocean air? Well, you're certainly not going to have maritime tropical air over Nebraska. You know, that wouldn't really make any sense. Okay, so, you know, use a little common sense with it. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, answer it for you, but I think you can figure it out. Uh, where would you find the maritime tropical air? Where would you find the continental polar air? Now, um, let me just take a quick look at these questions. Uh, okay, yeah, I think the other questions are probably pretty fair. Uh, now we get to map E, and this is where people tend to have a hard time. It says, refer to maps B, C, and D, draw isobars, wind patterns, and areas of precipitation on map E. So now that's basically asking you to uh, combine the other maps onto this one. So now you're going to take the isotherms from map A and the isobars and, and uh, oh, and now it says to not do map A, B, C, and D. So you're going to be doing isobars, uh, wind patterns and precipitation, and overlaying that on top of this map. Part two on procedure E is where people get a little stuck. It's asking you to locate cold and warm fronts. This can be kind of hard uh, to locate where the fronts are on a weather map um, when you don't have the hang of it. But there's a few things to look for. So first of all, with a cold front, we're going to uh, see differences in temperature. You're, you're looking for uh, an imaginary boundary between cold and warm air. So you're looking for a place on the map where there's an area of cold air and then relatively suddenly the air becomes warm. The other thing that you're looking for here are rapid changes in wind direction. Like for example, maybe the station model has the wind coming out of the northwest like that. 
and then slightly uh, east of it, the station model now has the wind coming uh, from the south. That's a pretty rapid change in wind, dire excuse me, wind direction. Uh, and that signifies the location of a front as well. So when you're looking at the map, what you want to look for are areas where the temperature changes pretty drastically. You know, maybe the temperature is in the 50s, and then all of a sudden it jumps into the 80s, you know, uh, something like that. That would indicate that there's a front there. Also, too, remember that your fronts are going to be where it's raining. So don't waste the time looking for a front in California because there isn't going to be one. Hey, okay, look for the fronts where there's rain. Uh, your fronts are going to be coming out of the center of low pressure. So that's a pretty good hint. And what you're looking for with the cold front is the cold, cold moving into warm. So look at those wind directions and look at where there's cold air and warm air. And you want to see the cold air getting being, uh, getting blown into where the warm air is. The warm front is going to be the opposite. You're still looking at a boundary between cold air and warm air. But now what you're looking for is warm air being blown into areas where there's colder air. And, you know, cold is relative. Maybe cold is 40 or 50. It, you know, th there's no definition of what warm and cold are. It just is how they compare to each other. You know, uh, on a 90 degree summer day, 70 degrees might be cold. And in the wintertime, 70 degrees would be a heat wave. So, you know, cold and warm are kind of relative terms depending on the season and, and what the weather has been like. But anyway, to summarize, what you want to look for to find the fronts, you want to find uh, different temperature air. You know, you want to see large temperature changes, you know, like it going from like maybe 40 degrees to 80 degrees or something like that. So large changes in temperature, large changes in wind direction. You want to see rain. Those are all signs that you've got a front. Now to decide if it's the warm front or the cold front, maybe I'll jump down here. Remember, uh, with your cold front, you want to see uh, the wind pushing cold into warm. And for the warm front, it's going to be the opposite. You, you really need to pay attention to those wind directions. And uh, again, those wind directions are going to change dramatically. You know, uh, maybe I'm not saying that the front is over here at all because it, it isn't. But like in Denver, we've got wind coming out of the southwest. And then uh, over here, we have wind coming out of uh, the west. Here, wind coming out of the northeast. You know, so look for dramatic changes in wind direction, different temperatures, rain. And what you want to try to do is draw those fronts in. So uh, if you think you found the boundary between the cold air and the warm air, and you think the cold air is moving into the warm air, then you're going to draw the line for a cold front, which is going to be the line with the triangles. It doesn't have to be a straight line either. It could curve or bend in any way. Uh, the warm front, same deal. You're going to draw your line half circles where the warm air is moving into the cool air. And again, that doesn't have to be a straight line. In fact, it probably won't be. Okay, and then uh, lastly, you've got uh, your discussion questions at the end. Um, and you'll find the answers to some of these and some of the other videos I made about fronts. Uh, so, you know, I know I addressed this in some of the other videos. If you don't remember, you might need to go back a little bit and maybe rewatch uh, some of those videos about fronts and source regions and things like that. Okay, but otherwise, I think uh, you, you'll probably do okay. Give it your best chance, uh, your best shot, and we'll take a look at it uh, when I when I get back. Okay, so good luck with that, and um, that's it.